This is a podcast by The Straits Times and Money FM 89.3. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Speaking of Asia podcast by The Straits Times. This is Ravi Velour, and I'm an associate editor and Asia columnist for the paper, as well as ST's former foreign editor. This series of podcasts focuses on Asian issues and distills experience from four decades of covering the continent. In this episode, I focus on the fraught relationship between the two giant nations of Asia. China and India. Because of their size, each of them has more than 1.3 billion people, they are often called Asia's tectonic plates. Naturally, when such big plates rub up against each other, a lot of friction can result, and we've seen plenty in the past six decades. The two nations fought a brief border war in 1962 that sowed centuries of relatively peaceful exchanges. That war went badly for India, and it led to a swift modernization of its military. The 1962 conflict took place during Chairman Mao's Great Leap Forward, a period of history that most Chinese would like to forget. For India, however, forgetting and forgiving has not been easy. Today, the two do not even agree on the length of the boundary under dispute. And last year, in June, Tensions erupted into savage clashes leading to deaths on both sides. Recently, there have been reports about more troops being pushed into the border areas, and Chinese President Xi Jinping has just made a rare visit to Tibet, across from India's Arunachal Pradesh state. He was accompanied by the vice chairman of the Central Military Commission. In a sense, the two armies are standing pretty much eyeball to eyeball. In this episode, which is going to be longer than the usual 15 minutes, I have a guest on air for a change to discuss the subject of China and India. And he is Professor Kanti Bajpai, who has the Wilma Chair on Asian Studies at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. As it happens, Prof. Bajpai has just published a book, and it is called India vs. China, Why They Are Not Friends. So, there could not be a more appropriate person at this juncture to discuss this most important relationship. Welcome to the Speaking of Asia podcast, Dr. Bajpai. Thank you very much, Ravi. I'm very happy to be here. I'd like to begin by asking for your assessment on what is happening on the border today. How worried should we be? I think we should be quite worried. It's been a year since the clashes. The two militaries have not disengaged except in one small sector in Ladakh. In the meantime, you pointed out, Chairman Xi Jinping has just been to Ningchi and Lhasa, which is on the eastern sector of the border, eastern from the perspective of India. This suggests that the eastern sector is also a live area in terms of the possibility of military confrontations. And the one thing I would point to here is that most of the major military command centers of the PLA, the Chinese military, they are closer to India's eastern sector, that is Ningchi, Lhasa, and of course further away, Chengdu. Now, Chengdu is a very important military center. In Ladakh, the closest major military center that the Chinese have is in Hotan. Hotan is in Xinjiang. It's quite a distance away from where the action is at the present. Also note that in respect of the eastern sector and India's state of Arunachal Pradesh, which China calls South Tibet. Chinese statements over the years on their claims there have been very, very strong. We can say more about why this sector is very important, but I think that's my initial sense of it. So not only has there been no disengagement in Ladakh, which is the Western sector, there are things happening and there are claims on India's Eastern sector in Arunachal Pradesh, which are very important for the Chinese. Turning to your book, uh, I was intrigued by the very title, India versus China. Why not say India and China? Partly, to be honest, uh, this is always a a book publishing marketing issue. And uh, my publisher, Juggernaut, uh, wants something that hits the consumer, the buyer, between the eyes. I did personally uh, 
opt for, vote for India and China, but they thought it was too anodyne, uh, too boring. Um, and so they wanted to hit, as I said, the consumer between the eyes. At the end of the day, you've got to go with what your publisher wants, as long as it's not scandalously uh, opposed to what you are comfortable with. So that's that's the reason. But I think the other more serious reason is that this is a general reader book, and they wanted, particularly the Indian audience, to get a sense of why, after about 40 or 50 years of relative stability, suddenly we had Galwan last year, which is the conflict in Ladakh. And in order to dramatize that, I think, one had to bring home to the reader that this was India versus China, that there's something brittle and possibly very violent uh, going on here. Prof. Vajpayee, you break up the Sino-Indian problem into uh, four piece. Uh, you call it perception, parameters, partnerships, and power. And then you add a tentative fifth P, which is uh, Pakistan. Could you give us a short explanation about each of these four Ps? Yes, thanks very much. I mean, the four Ps are the heart of the book. The relationship between the two countries is very wide-ranging. So... Initially, I had a list of, you know, 10 chapters. But that was the problem. The book would have looked like a list. I had to get to the heart of the issue. And it seemed to me these four Ps were really the heart of why they couldn't get along, why they weren't friends. The first P is perceptions, as you point out, which really deals with how the two societies look at each other. Historically, going back to the Buddhist period and running it forward all the way to now. Mm. And the broad thesis there is, that there are bad feelings on both sides mm -hmm. about each other. Mm -hmm. Sadly, there's a mix of jingoism, sometimes of racism, sometimes of just pure befuddlement at each other, mm -hmm. a lot of cliches and, and caricatures of each other. On the Chinese side, late in the 19th century, amongst Chinese political reformers who were facing the prospect of European domination, they were curious at how India a neighboring great civilization, had so easily fallen under British rule for 200 years or so. And they looked at that and said, gosh, I, I hope that's not us. And they, ought, they, they sought to diagnose what went wrong in India. And they concluded that Indian society was fragile, was divided by caste, by religion, by region, by language, that there was kind of social chaos. And they lamented this, but the lesson they drew was, don't be like India. And I think a kind of condescension towards India has remained since then. Of course, there are bad feelings on the Indian side as well, negative feelings. Uh, as much as there's sometimes a feeling of civilizational superiority on the Chinese side, these are matched by the Indians. Indians think they gave Buddhism to China. Actually, the first Buddhist missionaries and influences in China came from Central Asia, not from India. Nonetheless, uh, given that inheritance, uh, there's a feeling that India can sort of look down on China civilizationally. None of this is warranted or true, quote unquote, but, you know, these perceptions are strong. And into the modern period right up to now, take, for instance, the views on both sides of how they've handled COVID. There have been mutual kind of accusations and bad feelings. Uh, on the Indian side, that China originated the virus, whatever the truth of that. And on the Chinese side, that India, again, you know, is so chaotic, uh, it's had a very bad handling of, of the COVID. And this typifies India's governance and social uh, instabilities. So I think that's the first thesis. The second is perimeters. This is familiar ground over the border and Tibet, the two perimeter areas. And I think here the problem is, and the book suggests, is that there's a trust problem there. And to say that is a bit tautological. That's a circular argument. You don't cooperate on the border, the perimeters, because you don't trust each other, and you don't trust each other because you don't cooperate. But I think tautologies of circular reasoning are quite interesting. They make you ask, well, why not trust? And I think there are three or four reasons for that. One is that these two main empires, historically, hardly ever interacted with each other directly. The second is that they've never been, and this is the third P, which I'll come to, they've never been strategic partners. They've never fought a common foe, except very briefly during World War II. 
when British India and the nationalists fought against the Japanese. So there's no basis for a deep strategic understanding between them at the level of their political elites, their military elites. The third lack of trust comes from looking at each other in the modern period, not really knowing each other. Mao didn't know the Congress Party, the Congress Party didn't know the communists, and their political styles are completely different. Uh, Jawala Nehru, India's first prime minister, uh, looked at conflicts and politics in terms of forensic things, the law, the constitution, procedures. For the Maoists, that is Maya, that's illusion. That's what the capitalist ruling class uses to get its way. So, you know, their political styles are completely different. And so when they promised or said things to each other, I think they had great difficulty in giving credence to the other's discourse. I mean, if you can't even understand each other's political discourse, it's hard to trust, hard to make commitments and hold to promises that, you know, the other side might comprehend. So I think those are some of the reasons that uh, there was always the possibility of a rational outcome on the border, but they simply couldn't trust each other for these reasons. The third P is partnerships. Here, very briefly, as I said, they have never been on the same side. The Chinese were with the Soviets during the Cold War and the early part. Then they were with the Americans. India was with the Soviet Union and briefly with the Americans during the 1962 war. Um, so until 1989, they were never on the same side. And after the Cold War, for a brief period, they had a kind of entente which against the Americans. But that quickly broke down. India became closer to the United States, which was looking over its shoulder at the growth of Chinese power and looking for quasi-allies or partners. And the Chinese, of course, were against the Americans. And again, India and China were never on the same side. So that's the third P. And the fourth P is power. And here we can be brief. I think uh, most of your listeners probably have a sense of it. But until about 1960 or even 1980, India and China were almost at par economically. Today, you know better than me that the GDP gap between them is enormous. China is five times India's size, uh, GDP terms. Its military is bigger somewhat. And interestingly, in the book, I also measure up soft power, and China comes out ahead there. That might be a bit counterintuitive, but it does. And so the power gap has increased massively. And what the implication of the power gap is this. China, because it's so big relative to India, doesn't see why it should accommodate India. And India, because it's so much weaker, doesn't know how to make a concession without appearing weak and appeasing China. So that, in short, is the book. It's a long statement, but I think that's the, the, the condensed, uh, as condensed as I can get about the book. Fascinating, and uh, thank you very much. But uh, to uh, talk about the last P uh, of your four Ps, which is uh, the power, and the asymmetry of power that you just detailed. Um, you do say in your book that the Himalayas and the Indian Ocean uh, are physical factors that sort of limit the impact uh, of China's dominance, uh, uh, you know, or asymmetrical, uh, you know, um, superiority. Uh, I found it interesting that in this era of standoff wars, when, uh, you know, that uh, geography can still bridge power asymmetry uh, uh, to the extent that you state. Uh, you know, I found it quite interesting. Yes, that's a striking point, actually. China certainly has a lead in respect of a number of uh, important weapon systems, both in the maritime domain, in the air, and on the ground. There's no doubt about it. However, when we're looking at geography, you've got to think about the Himalaya Mountains. And the areas where they might come into conflict are in the range of three to 4,000 meters high, if not higher. The air is extremely rarefied. For many parts of the year, it's freezing cold and well below zero. This is a very difficult space. And to think of any extended conflict here, uh, military operations that are very ambitious, is virtually impossible. I mean, I cannot think historically over thousands of years of human warfare of two armies of this size fighting extended operations in these kinds of terrains. The only other comparable one is India and Pakistan on the Siachen Glacier, and they virtually can't do anything there. Although they have some light tanks and artillery and so on, uh, 
there's not much they can do. And as far as standoff weapons go, one thinks of drones. Well, if you have deep ravines, escarpments, valleys, and all kinds of mountainous terrain, even drones will have a great difficulty navigating these kinds of, of areas. I mean, not all of this area is like that. There are flat areas, of course, because of Ladakh, uh, which is a plateau. But in many areas, uh, these are inhospitable even to drones. Now, UAVs, uh, which operate at much greater heights, might be more effective. But at the moment, they're still fairly limited in terms of the numbers of deployments. And the Chinese there certainly have superiority. And the brief point I make in the book is that, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not a military expert per se. There are technologies coming online, which if the Indians don't catch up on, there could be some surprises ahead. So I think that's a very important point. In the maritime domain, again, here, it's not mountains, obviously, but it's distance. The Chinese Navy is already superior to the Indian, but from its bases on its seacoast, from Hainan and so on, to come all the way out into the Bay of Bengal and then beyond that into the Arabian Sea on India's western coast, that's a long way to go. And the Indians have at least two or three advantages. One, they can block them for some time in the Malacca Strait, especially with the help of other navies. They can then intercept them if they get past the Malacca Strait into the Bay of Bengal and thence forward to East Africa and the Gulf. And to the extent, thirdly, that the Chinese have bases in, say, East Africa someday, they're already in Djibouti, perhaps they get Gwadar in Pakistan, all those will be vulnerable to the Indian Navy, which can sail out of its western bases and can use its long-range fighter aircraft and bombers uh, if not its navy, to bottle up the Chinese. So these bases that people are worried about so much that the Chinese might have, they could actually be extremely vulnerable, and I think the Chinese know it. So we have a period here where even in the maritime domain, even though India is relatively inferior, you know, the asymmetry may not count as much as we think. I've heard some serious Indian foreign policy people say that uh, after what's happened in Galwan, in Ladakh, in June last year, the relationship between the two countries has been set back for at least a generation. Do you agree? That's one way of putting it. I think what they're saying is that until 1988, from 1962 when India lost the war to 1988, the Indian stand was, we will not normalize relationships with China, people to people, trade, so on, until there's a settlement of the border such that the Chinese basically withdraw and honor all Indian claims. In 1988, when Rajiv Gandhi went to meet Deng Xiaoping in Beijing, the first trip by an Indian prime minister since 1954, he turned that proposition almost on its head by accepting the Chinese view that even while they discuss the border head-on directly, they ought to loosen up and normalize the relationship. And the two sets of elements of the relationship would then play positively on each other. The border negotiations, to the extent they move forward, would help normalize. The normalization of diplomatic relations would soften up the border quarrel. So from 1988 to about 2010, you can see that that was the core of the India-China relationship positive energies and synergies there. But from 2010 onwards, you begin to see, maybe a little earlier, 2006 perhaps, you begin to see the tempo of border problems intensifying. And then we have a series of confrontations that first peaked in Doklam in 2017, and then of course 2020 Galwan. The confrontation in 2013 in Depsang, 2014 in Chumar, even while Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping were in Gujarat together for Xi Jinping's first trip to India. There were two armies glaring at each other in Chumar. 2015, I think most people have forgotten this one, in a place called Bertsi, also in Ladakh, was another confrontation. 2017, of course, Doklam for 73 days, and now, of course, Galwan. So from about 2006 onwards, first, an increasing number of transgressions or incursions across the border, culminating in a series of these military confrontations. And I think gradually on the Indian side, what has happened is that the 1988 policy of Rajiv Gandhi, 
was thrown into doubt increasingly. And what's grown is a view that's hearkening back to, going back to the kind of policy thinking post-1962, which Modi articulated first in 2014 at the summit with Xi Jinping, and then again in his summit in Beijing in 2015, where he said, we can't take normalization further if we don't make progress on the border, or at least the line of actual control. The line of actual control is where the militaries actually are today. So let's at least delineate that, if not get a border settlement. Let's at least accept where we are in control of, of territory. Uh, the Chinese brushed it away. So the view has grown, and it's sharpened with these confrontations, that the idea that normalization would soften the border quarrel, that part has not worked. Nor have the two sides made enough progress on the border negotiations. So neither parts of the diplomatic structure was doing too well. And so we're back to a kind of post-1962 thinking, which is we've got to get progress on the border now before we can normalize further. And Foreign Minister Jay Shankar, who, by the way, was Indian ambassador here in Singapore for several years, he said very clearly that it cannot be business as usual. And he's referring to the 1988 Rajiv Gandhi kind of policy, which was followed by every government after that, including Modi in the early days. Uh, there has to be first military disengagement now in Galwan. Have to go back to substantive, rich, fruitful talks on the border, line of actual control, before now we can move back to a more normalized relationship. So that's where, you know, the two sides have come out. And I think that's the import of what you quoted from these strategic experts in India, which is the last 20, 30 years, kind of diplomatic conventions and normal view has just gone out of the window as a result of Galwan. But Galwan was the peak of that. The Indian view was beginning to change from about 2006, 2010 onwards anyway. What brought it up? In about 2006, and now this is ironic because in 2005, they came to a, the kind of broad outlines of the principles that would govern a final settlement of the border. This is the 2005 agreement on the guidelines and parameters of, of a final settlement. And there was a lot of clapping on both sides. Almost immediately, the Chinese repudiated one element of it, which was there was a clause in there that said any settlement will be without, you know, will take into account that populations cannot be, in the border areas cannot be disturbed. And the Chinese immediately kind of, within months, said they weren't quite on the page on that one. Um, and then in 2006, the Chinese began to assert much more publicly, I mean, they'd always held it, but they much more publicly, their claim to all of Arunachal Pradesh. Um, and their ambassador in Delhi, I think in 2006, said it just before the Chinese premier came to visit uh, in Delhi. And that was seen as very significant. Uh, and they also began to, the Chinese, to not issue visas uh, to residents of Arunachal Pradesh who wanted to go to China. So there were a number of these kinds of... In retaliation, the Indians backed off from very public acknowledgement of the status of Tibet within China. And the Indian joint statement stopped mentioning Tibet, although India sticks to the one-China policy, but it doesn't now acknowledge it very publicly, and the Chinese got the message. So I think you've seen a steady... And then the border transgressions increased. Now, we only have... India's record of Chinese incursions onto the Indian side because the Chinese don't tell us the numbers of Indian trooping incursions into what they claim. But we, from, judging from the Indian figures, the curve has been rising. And then, as I say, it peaked in these various episodes, 2013, 14, 15 onwards. And so I think, you know, that tells us a story about how things have gone wrong and why they've gone wrong. And I always think that when you see trouble between India and China on the border, think Tibet. It goes back to a point I was making earlier. I think sometimes in India, there's not enough of an understanding, and perhaps in other countries as well, how sensitive the Chinese remain to Tibet for the reasons I articulated earlier. It's not that an army is going to invade Tibet. The Chinese know that and take it over and pry it away, or that a, a rebellion will occur in uh, Tibet that they can't handle beyond a point. It's that the political symbolism within China of continuing troubles in Tibet with India next door, 
uh, will make it very difficult for the domestic leadership in Beijing to answer to their populations. China, superpower, America's peer, in some respects, now an economy that's bigger than America's in PPP terms, you can't handle Tibet. You see, so the problems of Tibet in this period uh, have to be watched. And the Dalai Lama is 86 years old. I hope he lives a very long time, but a transition is beginning towards the choosing of a new Dalai Lama. Now imagine a situation where, for sure, the Chinese will select a Dalai Lama of their nomination. The Tibetan community within India, and there's a diaspora all over the world, may elect or choose another Dalai Lama. Where will Delhi go? There'll be intense pressure from Beijing to recognize Beijing's nominee, and Delhi will have to think about the alternative Dalai Lama that's being put forward. I don't envy Delhi's choices at that point. And so this, this issue of Tibet, I think, has f clearly filtered into Chinese thinking and the transition that's beginning. Uh, There's another reason to be quite worried about the future of China-India relations. I don't foreground this as much in the book, but I think this has come home to me more as I've discussed the issue of India-China in forums like this, in podcasts and, and shows like this. This podcast is available on our audio app. That's A-W-E-D-I-O. Like us and rate us. And now, back to our podcast episode. Back to Prof. Kanti Bajpai. You list out the cultural contacts between these two ancient civilizations and how they waxed and waned over the centuries. Now, I've seen uh, Chinese-style fishing nets on the Kerala coast, uh, and the favorite cooking vessel in those parts uh, is what is called the China Chatti, or Chinese wok. And uh, you might remember that George Yeo, uh, who was Singapore's foreign minister, uh, got ASEAN to back a proposal to revive the ancient Buddhist University of Nalanda. And if you go to Nalanda, uh, you can see the memorial hall to uh, Huansang, built by Chinese artisans. It really is a work of love, and the Chinese workmen spent months on that project. Does this all not matter when it comes to the bilateral relationship? I think it matters up to a point. The book is focused laser-like on what divides them. But I do say that, of course, there's a record of cooperation, of brotherhood, of cultural convergence sometimes, of exchange. Very broadly, you can see that until about 900 of the Christian era, maybe even 1,000. Very broadly, elements in China looked up to India because of Buddhism, because it was the land of Buddha. Pilgrims came, traders, intellectuals, others. Thereafter, you go to a period where you mentioned Kerala, but also in Bengal, in the 14th century, maybe even up to, well, from about the 13th to the early 15th century, there were kingdoms in southern India, Sri Lanka, what is now Sri Lanka, and in Bengal that paid tribute to the Chinese court. So this is a period of India, as it were, looking up to China. Then there's colonialism, and I think that's where a lot of the trouble begins because perceptions of the two sides increasingly are mediated through British sources, French sources, German sources, and Japanese sources. Japanese, in turn, took a lot of their views of India through European sources. And there, there's a kind of orientalizing that goes on. British visions of China in a negative light, color Indian perceptions. Similarly, the Chinese get views of India, colonial India, and even ancient India through colonial eyes, and they're negative as well. So you enter a period of two to 300 years where the two sides don't look at each other in a very gentle eye. I mean, again, what, it, you have to be careful because we're talking about elites, not the mass of people who hardly know each other and have a, and no sense of each other, really. And then we get to the modern period, of course. But clearly, I mean, you can see from this very quick fingernail po portrait that I've shared that there were periods when they respected each other and liked each other in a limited sort of way. Because of geography, 
there wasn't the kind of intimate contact that the Europeans had of each other in, in Europe. Uh, or perhaps East Asian societies had amongst themselves, China, the Koreas, well, Korea, and, and Japan, for instance, or Vietnam as well. So I think with India and China, there's certainly elements where they had a gentler, kinder look. But it was never a very intimate viewpoint, especially in the modern period. And by the ni- late 19th century, as I said earlier, the Chinese began to look down on India at the intellectual level. I mean, the one great exception were those who believed in Asian solidarity on the Chinese side. On the Indian side, of course, there was a great Nobel laureate, Rabindranath Tagore, who, as you know, built Chini Bhavan. He got donors who were ethnic Chinese from Southeast Asia and other parts. And he started a program of exchange between Indians, Chinese, Japanese, and others interested in Asian relations and in India-China issues. And I think that stood for a long time. But even there, you know, I mean, sadly, when Tagore went to China, he did have uh, followers there who respected him. But when he spoke at one or two venues, he was shouted down by some of the communists there and other Chinese nationalists, young people who were impatient with this old man. Said, your message of sort of cosmopolitan and brotherly love, that's not what we're about. Your kind of belittling modernization and, and so on, that's not where we're at. We want full blown kind of Western style modernity. Um, and, you know, this man with the flowing beard, poetic expression, they just found him out of it, fuddy duddy. So, you know, I mean, I think this is kind of. We got to stare this issue straight in the eye. Mm. That for all the talk of India, China brotherhood, and mm. so on, mm. they were neither very knowledgeable about each other, right. nor particularly kindly eyed, right. and that's kind of remained. This, the title of some book said "Distant Neighbors." Yeah, that's one way of of uh, putting it. Excellent, uh, Prof. Bajpai, your book speaks of a visit to India by the Chinese Premier Wen Jiapao. Uh, perhaps it was in two thousand and five. Uh, I was posted in in India then, uh, uh, and I was in the room when Premier Wen spoke of the Twin Pagodas, uh, particularly in the IT industry. And uh, he really meant India in software and the Chinese in hardware. And in that year, I remember something like 150 Chinese delegations, uh, software delegations visited India that year. Uh, Today, India has backed out from signing the RCEP, which is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, because it fears that China will dominate that uh, free trade agreement. Um, It does not want to give China easy access to its markets. Uh, India has also been driving Chinese capital away from its startups and will not participate in the Belt and Road Initiative. Does it have good reason to do so? It's a difficult one to answer. And I think the debate in India has been quite robust on both sides of the argument. I'm not an economist, but I think the common sense of it is that there's force on both sides. On the whole, my own view is that, take for instance, RCEP, from the bigger picture point of view, bigger strategic point of view, that has not served India well. And I wouldn't be surprised if at some point... India will have to find a way back to it. Perhaps some kind of special agreement for India within that. The larger point about whether economics really becomes a vulnerability in this bilateral relationship, whether the Chinese can exploit India's dependence on its products, whether China can exploit the investment coming into its startup domains, whether the Chinese can exploit the, the general sense that, you know, uh, they have the economic upper hand in some strategic areas, such as, for instance, the APIs that they, they provide for India's pharmaceuticals. I think history between many countries shows that we exaggerate that kind of economic leverage. When you invest in a country, those funds are locked up in that country. If you want your returns you better stay friendly because otherwise they may be denied to you. If you have exported to a market, well, you've got a stake in exporting. If you try to exploit that by stopping exports, 
you can only exploit it if the receiving country, India in this case, has no alternatives from which to source things. But it does have. It has Westerners, it has Southeast Asian producers of certain kinds of goods, the Japanese and so on. Now, they may not have immediately the scale of output which India would want. They may not have the right price. But India could source from alternative areas. So if there are substitutes, then the leverage doesn't work. And I think that's true for investments as well. So I, to my mind, this issue of whether India would be giving China leverage by going into the RCEP, allowing Chinese investments to come in, allowing Chinese companies to produce infrastructure within India to tender for Indian projects and then come in, all of that is rather exaggerated, I think. And my own sense is that the reaction of the Modi government to both trade and, and investment has been more kind of driven by domestic interests. And actually, you can see this also in terms of some of the rethinking on the Indian side in bilateral trade agreements with Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. I mean, these are small countries where India, in a sense, would have the upper hand economically. But there are Indian sectors of Indian manufacturers who are unhappy even with those trade agreements, let alone trade with China. So I think domestic interests have played a, a role. And that's not surprising. They do everywhere. But I think it's a, been a failure, calculate, calculative failure on the part of India to weigh up the costs and benefits in the bigger strategic picture. And in a sense, stepping out of the RCEP um, has taken India out of a good part of the strategic economic game, game in the geoeconomics, as it were, of, of East Asia. And India has lost the opportunity also in a sense of, I mean, to the extent that it's reducing or making trade difficult and investments difficult, it could lose the opportunity of doing a China on China. What do I mean by that? I mean by that what the Chinese did with the United States for about 30 years, let's say, which is it had its difficulties with Washington, but it adopted Deng Xiaoping's hide and bide in order to attract American investment, American technology, American forbearance strategically so that it could develop internally and become a frontline power that it is today. I mean, in a sense, that's what India was trying to do from about 1988 onwards until the bilateral conflicts of the, on the border sharpened. But it still seems to me that's, it, that's kind of the way to go. You have to try and use the Chinese market, Chinese finance, technology. I mean, of course, keeping an eye on your national security so that India can build up its own strength and then look the Chinese straight in the eye as an equal power. So my overall conclusion is that I think India has to rethink it. And if we look at the first quarter figures for trade this year, uh, trade is very robust. It's grown faster than with any other country. Um, and India is already allowing investments back in. If the investment is up to 25% of a, an enterprise in India, uh, it's not even being vetted. It's automatic clearance. So I think you know India has a sense that it'll have to find a way back to a, a, a more normal economic relationship, barring a few areas where which are very strategic. Very good. Uh, when you said APIs, I suppose you meant active pharmaceutical ingredients. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. Prof, I want to pick up on that subject of partnerships, which is one of the four Ps uh, that you list out. And I want to bring in the United States at this point. Now, almost uh, a decade ago, I had dinner with uh, Madame Fu Ying, who used to be China's vice foreign minister. And I asked her if she thought that India was getting too close to the United States for China's comfort. At that time, she told me that uh, the Chinese assessment was that India always distrusted alliances and would like to plow its own furrow in world affairs. Uh, in fact, uh, her very words were, India is well behaved. That's the way she put it. Now, I thought that was a bit patronizing, uh, but I let it pass. Uh, do you think India moving closer to the U.S. is impacting on the China relationship? Uh, or is that a function of the bad bilateral ties between Delhi and Beijing? I think both things are probably true, and I agree. It's a rather patronizing statement. But I, I, I think probably something was lost in translation. <laughs> she probably meant was that India is doing things that you know, we're okay with. Uh, but what is true is that contrary to the general view that 
India was very strictly non-aligned from 1947 onwards. Uh, it was and it wasn't, uh, depending on what you mean by non-alignment. But it's certain that India has signed up to partnerships against China throughout this period. It was first inclined towards the Anglo-American powers from 1947 to about 1955. Once the Soviets began to look at India with a kindlier eye, India gradually began to be closer to the Soviet Union, peaking in the 1971 Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation that India signed, which went on till the end of the Cold War and a bit beyond. After the Cold War, as I said earlier, India has moved closer and closer to the United States in the face of China's power. It's very clear that in every case, virtually, India's strategic eye has been cast northwards towards China, and it has sought these partnerships as a kind of leveling or a balancing factor. The Chinese have had partners as well, but not against India, except for Pakistan. But I don't deal with Pakistan in the book for a particular reason, but the Chinese have never partnered with the Soviets against India or the Americans against India. Uh, they haven't needed to because they thought they, they were economically and militarily superior. So India has always drifted towards one of the two big powers. And currently, as you say, it's closer to the United States. And I certainly think that it plays in Chinese thinking today. Not because necessarily because it'll tilt the balance, because of course the Americans are still bigger than China. But it's more that the signaling on China's periphery of a major country allying closely or partnering closely with the United States, you know, it says something then about China standing in the world and how other countries might look at China. If India fairly decisively tilts towards the Americans and partners up, you know, this is potentially embarrassing for China. It might have a knock-on effect to other countries on the periphery and of course, the Japanese are already formal alliance partners. So are the South Koreans. Taiwan has a status somewhere in between, probably. But there are many other countries in play. What if they were to take their cue from India? So I think that the symbolism of it, the diplomatic kind of signaling of it, is really very important. The other point is a more historical one. And it relates to India and America. And that is the T word, Tibet got to remember, which I show in the book, that in the 1950s, when the rebellion occurred in Tibet in 1955-56 in amongst the Kampas and then spread to Lhasa, the Chinese were very clear that they saw an American hand there, which we now know is true. There was CIA interference. Some of the CIA interference operated from bases in India, although a lot of it actually probably was from what we now know as uh, uh, Bangladesh, parts of Pakistan, and maybe even Sri Lanka, beaming radio programs and things like that. And, uh, but the Chinese saw in, uh, India pallying up with the Americans to interfere in Tibet. And so, you know, when India and the United States get together, Tibet, I think, is a, an issue that plays with China. And there's a fear that, again, uh, these two powers might intervene in Tibet. Now, the Chinese are pretty firmly in control of Tibet, but I come back to the symbolism of it. You know, if there was trouble in Tibet and if they find it difficult to control, it's not that China will break, break up, but in the heartland of China, you know, on the eastern part of China where most Han Chinese live, there might be a questioning. The CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, can't you handle Tibet? What's going on here? You know, and I don't think the Communist Party wants that. So, you know, this India-US relationship is not just, as a lot of people I think think, of some kind of just ganging up containment and so on. It has other echoes for the Chinese. Diplomatic signaling, symbolism, messaging to other parties, and, and, and then the possibility of, of, a, of Tibet. It's a very interesting point that you make, uh, uh, Dr. Bajpayee, because uh, as we record this podcast on the 5th of August, uh, the Indonesian foreign minister is in Washington, D.C. to discuss a strategic partnership. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, the demonstrative, uh, the demonstration effect that you just spoke about uh, in the U.S.-India relationship is very pertinent uh, in that context as well. It's China's domino effect, you see. If the Indian domino falls on the American side, who knows which other dominoes might fall on the American side more obviously, more explicitly in the rest of Asia particularly. Very interesting insight, and thank you for that. Uh, Prof, um, one of the elements in your book that... uh, resounded with me is when you uh, express uh, apprehension that you might be considered a liberal or pandahaga uh, for laying out the truth as you see it. I'm aware that you come from a family that's produced many distinguished Indian diplomats uh, and that you have a huge circle of friends uh, in the Indian Foreign Service. So was it difficult for you to write this book? I suppose uh, I've been preparing to write this book, in a sense, in my mind for a long time. Uh, One of the things uh, I came to Singapore to do was to think about India-China relations much more than I had in the past. And uh, that was part of my remit at the Lee Kuan Yew School, and it's been fabulous. I think that what I did set out to do was to write a balanced book. So the book tries to show how both sides have played their role in why they can't be friends or why they aren't friends. And I think that's where it seemed to me critics, readers might look at, and particularly in India, and sort of say, aren't you too balanced here? Um, aren't, shouldn't you be pointing fingers and making judgments about who did what and isn't China more at fault? And I think that's a fair point. Uh, one could say that. But the book is not really about pointing fingers and laying blame. There's room for that. Academics can do, can and should do it. Should, so should other writers. But there's quite a lot of that already. Quite a number of books that are very partisan on both sides. Particularly, I think, on the Indian side, because a lot of the writing is in English by Anglo-American writers, by Indian writers. Less so on the Chinese side. But I set out to write a book which... I think tried as much as possible, I'm Indian, of course, to write a balanced account. And to that extent, I think it's a very liberal book. Um, So far, the reaction, I think, in India, which is mostly where people have reacted to the book, has been positive. Um, And I think my publishers had a sense that there was a room, uh, there was space for a book that would be that kind of balanced book. Um, So I haven't been slapped around too much, uh, rightly or wrongly. Um, And I think if the book has a contribution, it would be that it's written without too much jargon. It's written simply and it's balanced. And I think balance for me is not just a kind of choice. That's where it seemed to me the evidence is that you can see on both sides that things have gone wrong and has led to, you know, the kind of uh, conflict that we have. Very interesting. Uh, I've always believed that uh, uh, Indian governments have never really told the truth or the full truth of the uh, China relationship to its own people. And uh, I hope uh, that books like yours can uh, clarify some of the clouds uh, that exist in the Indian minds and uh, present a more balanced picture to Indians themselves, and I hope your book gets read. Uh, So uh, thank you for that. Um, Prof, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you've been in Singapore for more than 10 years. Uh, Am I correct? Yes, uh, 10 uh, very happy and very productive years. Excellent. Now, you finished the last uh, response by talking about uh, how the Indians view uh, Chinese and uh, how rigid they can be, and sometimes They tend to box you into particular boxes for thinking in a particular way about China. Have you started seeing a bit of that uh, in this region and particularly in Singapore? I think the answer is that there are quite different views in the region, within countries and across the region. So obviously some of the smaller countries bordering China have more positive views. Some that are more distant and have territorial or other conflicts have more mixed views of China. And then some that don't have any great territorial or other conflicts uh, probably have the most uh, positive. I think, to my mind, from what I've seen, probably Singapore falls in that. It doesn't have South China Sea conflict uh, with China. It's a bit more distant geographically. um, And it doesn't see itself thrown into the kind of strategic trenches directly uh, 
with China in that sense. But clearly, the pressures in the differences between the United States and China are telling on all the countries of Southeast Asia. And again, differentially, but they're, they're on, on all the countries, including Singapore, from what I, I can see. And I think Singapore's prime minister and other spokesmen have been fairly candid about that, warning that it'll be difficult times for the region. My sense is that it's not so polarized, though, overall, which is to say that countries have incentives and they recognize it very clearly to do business with China and literally business, which is economic business, but also diplomatic business with China. They can profit from China in other ways, the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. They value Chinese investments of other kinds. They have Chinese diasporic populations that bring certain strengths to, to their countries. So I think that's one, one view. And then the very same person in amongst these countries also recognizes that there's a structural problem. China is bigger than all the Southeast Asian countries put together by a huge distance. China has historically been a kind of hegemon that sought tribute or received tribute and might be minded to look at itself again like that. There's a fear of that, founded or unfounded. I think as much as the diaspora in some countries might be seen as a positive force, there are worries about perhaps some of the Chinese diaspora. Um, and of course, there's those who have conflicts, such as in the South China Sea, uh, have a fear of that and would reach out to the West, the United States particularly, say Australia, Japan, or even India, as a balancing factor. And I think this is captured in the idea that everyone in Southeast Asia is hedging, doing business with China, staying good with the Chinese that way, uh, but at the same time taking out insurance on the security side with the United States. So hedging is doing two contradictory things at the same time for your security. And that, to some extent, you could say India has done that as well. It has, as we spoke earlier, fairly robust economic relationship. I mean, two-way trade between India and China is as big as India has with all of ASEAN. Um, at, at the same time, India has taken out insurance policy by developing its relationship with the other quad countries, that is Australia, Japan, and the United States. And of course, as part of the free and open Indo-Pacific and has a rather good relationship with ASEAN and all ASEAN's various plus pluses, ADM plus plus, uh, uh, East Asia Summit and so on. And that's the kind of diplomatic security or, or insurance policy that India's also got. So I think, you know, the, even India to some extent is quite split. Um, and so I wouldn't say it's as polarized as people make out. And the region has not done too badly. Very interesting. In fact, uh, I noticed that in your book, uh, you talk about the quadrilateral uh, dialogue uh, as a sort of uh, the military arm of the free and uh, open Indo-Pacific. Uh, while the in Indians and the Americans uh, insist that it is not a military partnership. Uh, I found that very interesting. Thank you very much for your insights and for your time. Uh, I wish you book uh, and yourself uh, every success. Uh, and thanks for helping Asians cut through the fog to see things for what they really are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ravi. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much again. Lovely chatting with you. And that wraps up our Speaking of Asia podcast for the month. I'm Ravi Velour, and do check out my byline in the Straits Times online. We also have links in our podcast text description below. And don't forget to subscribe to the revamped Asian Insider podcast on your favorite audio apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. I'll be back next month with the next Speaking of Asia podcast. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye. The Asian Insider Podcast channel is also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and our audio app. That's A-W-E-D-I-O. Like us and rate us.